welcome to Nazarene Israel. My name is Norman Willis, and I'm the Apostle for the Restoration of the Original First Century Faith. And in this part 20 of Revelation Simplified, we want to talk about why America is the land of Babylon in prophecy. So in the Nazarene Israel study, Nazarene Israel, the original faith of the Apostles, we talked about what's called the two-house theory. And two-house theory tells us that the Christians and the Jews are actually estranged brothers in the covenant, but that they're prophesied to come together in the end times. So as we take a look at the two houses, what we see is that in 1 Kings 11 and 12, after the reign of Kings David and Solomon, there came a split in the nation of Israel, with ten of the tribes being in the north, called the house of Israel, also the house of Ephraim, sometimes called the house of Joseph, because Ephraim was one of Joseph's two sons. And these were the forerunners, effectively, of today's Christians. And while we're speaking about Christians the world over, we'll also see there's a special role for the Christians in the United States of America, specifically the evangelical Christians and others. But we also saw two tribes left in the south of the land of Israel. This was called the House of Judah, and they're the forerunners of the Jews of today. And they, of course, are living in the land of Israel, also many Jews in the United States and in other places. Well, one of the things that we saw is that in Revelation 17, there's a series of eight kingdoms that afflict Yahweh's people Israel. The second of these kingdoms or empires was the Assyrian Empire, and then the third was the Babylonian Empire. So I'm going to minimize down here to the lower left-hand corner just to give more screen real estate. So in 722 BCE, there came what was called the Assyrian Captivity. And what was happening is the ten tribes in the north were not keeping the laws of Moses, otherwise called the Torah. So as a punishment for this, Yahweh sent the Assyrians in to take the ten northern tribes into captivity in what's later called the Assyrian captivity, or the Assyrian diaspora, or the dispersion. Well, in actual fact, the Assyrians, they didn't understand any commandment to punish the ten tribes. They were just trying to expand their empire. So they took, in fact, almost all of the twelve tribes. They took all but three of the walled cities of Judah into the captivity in Assyria. Well, after the Assyrian Empire broke up, Assyria was conquered by Babylon, what we see is that over the course of centuries, the ten tribes, actually the twelve tribes, have migrated north and west as empires have rose and fell, rose and fell. The characteristics of the twelve tribes, the things that were prophesied over them, began to follow the empires or the kingdoms that arose farther to the north and west. So again, after the Assyrian Empire uh, came the Babylonian Empire. We know from our earlier slide sets that the rabbis, the rabbinical order, was created in Babylon. So that's sometimes why we say Judah, or rabbinic Judah, is still located in Babylon. And that's also why they're in control of all the financial resources, is they're remaining in the head of gold. So they're effectively in the head and not the tail. And in contrast, the sons of Joseph, or Ephraim, are effectively in the legs and the feet. So how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news? But it's also the two legs of iron signifying the Roman Empire. And today, of course, we're in the fifth and final phase. We're in the two feet of iron mixed with miry clay, which is, of course, Islam. Now, one of the things that has happened is as Ephraim has traveled, so first the capital of the faith was in uh, Jerusalem, which is not on this map. Also, uh, before we get started, on the extreme right of this, I don't know if it'll show up on your, uh, shows up on your screen, but just to the right of Italy, there on the far right and the lower part of the screen, is the uh, vertical red line. That's the division that Emperor Constantine's cousin, Emperor Diocletian, drew in the administration of the Eastern versus the Western Roman Empire. So the Eastern Roman Empire, uh, it's a separate matter. We'll talk about that. Uh, 
But what here what we see is that we see Rome is clearly in the western leg of the empire. So originally, the original first capital of the faith was in Jerusalem. Then after the faith moved outside the land, the next capital of the faith effectively became Rome. And what we see is Rome, that's where, as we've seen before, that's where Esau dwells. It's also the home of Babylon. Now there's, there's different manifestations of Babylon. And what we're going to see is that as the center of the belief in Yeshua went from Jerusalem to Rome, there was a major corruption. And then from Rome further, it just spreads the corruption. So uh, first we have the, uh, as Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25 said, there would come a time when a little horn would arise and he would attempt to change the appointed times in the law. And the saints would be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. We explain this in the Nazarene Israel study. So after the time, times, and half a time were done, or 1260 years, then we had the Protestant Reformation. And the headquarters of the faith went first to Germany, and then after Germany for a short period of time, it ended up effectively in England, or we might say in London or Great Britain. So from there, the capital of the faith in Yeshua was in Great Britain for some time, and then effectively it transferred it's hard to say exactly when, but uh, long perhaps with the Bretton Woods Agreement uh, after World War II, transferring the location of the reserve currency. Also effectively with economic control, with economic capital, goes the burden or the responsibility for witnessing the faith. So sometime, whether it was after World War II or whenever it was, effectively the center of the Protestant Reformation then transferred to the United States. And then the United States, with its uh, strong financial position after the Second World War, uh, continued to spread the faith onward and so forth. But one of the things is that as they're not coming back to Jerusalem and they're not coming back to the original faith, basically until you come all the way back to the original faith, you're not back at the original faith. So everything in Scripture is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, we can see sort of pilgrim's progress, where they're progressing from Rome, then to London, and then now to uh, American forms of uh, Protestantism and the evangelical movement and these sorts of things. But once again, they're not yet practicing the faith once delivered to the saints. So in effect, they're still effectively spreading error. And Yahweh doesn't like error, and Yahweh punishes error. So basically, as Ephraim has continued traveling away from Rome, he's carried a variation of Mystery Babylon with him. And then now he's finally settling in the land of the USA, in the land of Babylon. So also there was a book written called Empire of the City, in which they, uh, the author pointed out the strange occult uh, correlations and significances between these three key towns. So one of the things that we see is that each one of these cities, Vatican City, there's also what's called the inner city of London, which is a city inside of London that serves as the financial capital uh, where the synagogue of Satan uh, effectively operates from. And then we have a third obelisk of Osiris at the Washington Monument in Washington, D.C. Again, all three of these towns are ruled by what's called Lex Fori, or Roman law. They're not ruled by the law of the land, but they're ruled by this special Roman law. So here we have obelisks of Osiris, we have Roman, or we could say Babylonian law, and we have a connection between them. What we see now today is that Vatican City operates as the spiritual route, then we have a financial center in the inner city of London, and then Washington, D.C. serves as the military arm or the military center. Now we're also going to see a special relationship to what's called Cleopatra's Needle. The obelisk of Osiris in the inner city of London, the financial capital of the three cities of empire, uh, that's called Cleopatra's Needle. 
There's a sister Cleopatra's needle that's also in New York City's Central Park. And that goes to show the relationship between, so you have Washington DC is effectively the headquarters of the nation and the military capital, but New York City has a special relationship because it's effectively the financial capital. And then we also have a tie to the uh, financial capital of the Babylonian three cities of empire as a whole in the inner city of London financial sector. So transition back up. Now, one of the things that we've seen, so we're seeing that there's some occult uh, signatures or significances going on uh, in the three cities of empire, but within the United States itself, again, everything in scripture is a double-edged sword. There's also a positive side. There's a positive aspect of the land of America. So in Genesis chapter 49, starting in verse 22, we read about the prophecy given by Israel to his sons, prophesying about the things that would come to pass in the last days. And one of the things that was prophesied was that because Joseph had been sold into slavery in Egypt, which is a type of the world, and went there ahead of the other sons, that he would become heir to certain special blessings. And he would also uh, to uh, prepare a deliverance by means of a great escape. We'll talk about that at some other point as well. But notice the prophecy. He says in verse, uh, Genesis 49, starting in verse 22, he says, Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a well. His branches run over the wall. So if we think about his branches as being the Protestant churches, and we think about the spread and the reach of em the American evangelical movement. Verse 23, he says the archers, and we know that Ishmael was described as an archer, so anytime we see a reference to archers or arrows or missiles, we can think about cousin Ishmael. It says the archers, or Ishmael, have bitterly grieved him, shot at him, and hated him. It says, but his bow remained in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty Elohim of Jacob. And sometime we'll talk about what it means. From there, the tribe of Joseph is a shepherd, the stone of Israel. We'll talk about that some of the time. He says, By the Elohim of your Father who will help you, and by the Almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breasts and of the womb. The blessings of your Father have surpassed the blessings of my ancestors up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. Sounds like a very rich, fertile land. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brothers. So we see again, there's some very wonderful blessings over the land of the United States of America. But there's also some passages in prophecy that speak about a mysterious land of Babylon that doesn't seem to match the ancient Babylon that today is in Iraq. Uh, it also speaks about the land of the Chaldeans, and it gives some descriptors that don't match the ancient land of Babylon in the Middle East. So what we see, we come to one of these passages is Jeremiah chapter 50. And starting in verse 1, it speaks about the destruction of the land of Babylon. Now let's, we're going to notice as we go through Jeremiah 50 and 51, there's certain things that seem to correlate to America and explains uh, much better and where there's no correlation in the Middle East. So it says, The word that Yahweh spoke against Babylon and against the land of the Chaldeans by Jeremiah the prophet. He says, Declare among the nations, proclaim, and set up a standard. Proclaim, do not conceal it. Say, Babylon is taken, Bel is shamed, Merodach is broken in pieces. Her idols are humiliated, her images are broken in pieces. So this is the simplified version of the timeline. So here we have a uh, second line down, third from the right. We're presently at seal six. We're waiting on the nuclear war to take place and the second eclipse. So after that comes the rise of the New World Order at seal seven. We have a half an hour of silence in heaven. Uh, and then we have after that becomes seven years of trumpets. So the 20 years and 10 months 
at the half hour of silence plus the seven years of trumpets, then we come to trumpet seven. That's when Babylon is judged in the heavenly. And then soon after, almost immediately after, come the cups or the bowls of wrath. And this is when uh, Yahweh's wrath effectively is poured out in the natural, not only on the land of Babylon, but also on the Babylonian system globally, worldwide. So continuing in Jeremiah 50 and verse 3 says, For out of the north a nation comes up against her, which shall make her land desolate, and no one shall dwell therein. They shall move, they shall depart, both man and beast. And in those days and at that time, says Yahweh, the children of Israel shall come, they and the children of Judah together. So we see that whatever this land is, it has to be a land where you have both the children of Israel or children of Ephraim or children of Joseph, the Christian peoples, and you have to have the children of Judah, the Jews. And the United States is one of those lands with many Christians and also many Jews, whether Reformed Jews or uh, conservative, sometimes modern Orthodox Jews. It has both of those together in the United States. And it says, With continual weeping they shall come, and seek Yahweh their Elohim. And they shall ask the way to Zion, with their faces toward it, saying, Come. Let us join ourselves to Yahweh in a perpetual covenant that will not be forgotten. Jeremiah 50 in verse 8 says, Move from the midst of Babylon, go out of the land of the Chaldeans, and be like rams before the flocks. For behold, I will raise and cause to come up against Babylon an assembly of great nations from the north country, and they shall array themselves against her. From there she shall be captured. Their arrows, when we see arrows, we think of cousin Ishmael, shall be like those of an expert warrior. None shall return in vain. And Chaldea shall become plunder. All who plunder her shall be satisfied, says Yahweh. So in that day, it's not going to be the place to be. Let's go to verse 12. It says, Your mother shall be deeply ashamed. She who bore you shall be ashamed. Behold, the last of the nations shall be a wilderness, a dry land and a desert. So some versions read the least of the nations or some other things. If we take a look at this word, we look it up. It's Strong's Hebrew or Old Testament 319, Aharit, and it basically means last. So in America, typically the United States is the last of the nations. So from there, things went into democracy and breakaways and this sort of thing. But the um, United States is literally the last of the nations. And so progressing on, in verse 17 it says, Israel is like scattered sheep. The lions have driven him away. First the king of Assyria devoured him because he was taken out in the Assyrian captivity. And it says, now at last this Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has broken his bones because he's been taken into the Babylonian system. Verse 18. Therefore, thus says Yahweh of hosts, the Elohim of Israel, Behold, I will punish the king of Babylon in his land, as I have punished the king of Assyria. But I will bring Israel back to his home, and he shall feed on Carmel and Bashan. His soul shall be satisfied on Mount Ephraim and Gilead. In those days and at that time, says Yahweh, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought but there shall be none, and the sins of Judah, but they shall not be found, for I will pardon those whom I preserve. In verse 23, it speaks again, we're talking about identifying characteristics for Babylon. It says, how the hammer of the whole earth has been cut apart and broken, how Babylon has become a desolation among the nations. I have laid a snare for you. And this phrase, the hammer of the whole earth, is very similar to what America, United States is usually called, which is the world's policeman. It's effectively the same, co uh, same concept of an enforcer. Verse 32 says, The most proud shall stumble and fall, and no one will raise him up. It says, I will kindle a fire in his cities, and it will devour all around him. 
So one of the thoughts is that cousin Ishmael, and we're talking almost 30, well, at least 27 years and 10 months from now, uh, one of the thoughts is that nuclear weapons technology will be more advanced in the Muslim nations by that point in time. And there will be a coalition of forces that will launch an overwhelming number of nuclear weapons toward the United States' cities. So it says, and I will kindle a fire in his cities, and it will devour all around him. So for those who will not be leaving the United States, the cities will not be the place to be. Some place out in the country would be vastly preferable. Verse 33. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, The children of Israel were oppressed, along with the children of Judah. All who took them captive have held them fast. They have refused to let them go. So this lets us know that we're looking for a land in which we have a high concentration of Christians and Jews. Verse 34. Their Redeemer is strong. Yahweh of hosts is his name. He will thoroughly plead their case, that he may give rest to the land and disquiet the inhabitants of Babylon. In text, what that means is he'll bring such destruction upon the land that the children of Israel will want to go home and the others will let them go. Verse 37. A sword is against their horses, against their chariots, and against all the mixed peoples who are in her midst. And that's descriptive of America. It's a very racially diverse nation. It says, and they will become like women. A sword is against her treasures, and they will be robbed. A draught is against her waters, and they will be dried up. For it is a land of carved images, and they are insane with their idols. Another, we're talking about identifying characteristics of the land of Babylon. We come to Revelation chapter 18 and verse 11. And we come to a description that sounds a lot like the New York Stock Exchange. It says, And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys their merchandise anymore. Merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet, and every kind of citron wood, and every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron, and marble, and cinnamon and incense, fragrant oil and frankincense, wine and oil, fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, and bodies and souls of men. And uh, if you look up uh, the straw man on the internet, it, what you'll find is that uh, the bodies and souls of men are literally sold on the New York Stock Exchange. So there's a process by which, uh, in a birth certificate, our name is entered in all caps. And this represents not us as a person, this represents us as a corporation. And these corporations and the futures from them literally are bought and sold on the stock exchange. So coming back to Jeremiah 50 and verse 41, it says, Behold, a people shall come from the north and a great nation and many kings shall be raised from the ends of the earth. They shall hold the bow and the lance. So again, bow, archer, think Ishmael. They are cruel and shall not show mercy. Their voice shall roar like the sea. They shall ride on horses, set in array, like a man for the battle, against you, O daughter of Babylon. So here Jeremiah 50 uses the term daughter of Babylon, and we're going to see this also in Isaiah chapter 47, where Isaiah 47 in verse 1 says, Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. So same land. Sit on the ground without a throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For you shall no more be called tender and delicate. And we drop to verse 6. Yahweh says, I was angry with my people. I have profaned my inheritance and given them into your hand. You showed them no mercy. On the elderly you laid your yoke very heavily. And it's understood that life can be very difficult for the elderly in the United States of America. In other words, spiritually, what happens to the elderly is not held in high esteem in the land of Babylon. So dropping to verse 8. Therefore, hear this now, you who are given to pleasures, who dwell securely, who say in your heart, I am, and there's no one else besides me. 
I shall not sit as a widow, nor shall I know the loss of children. But these two things shall come upon you in a moment, in one day, the loss of children and widowhood. They shall come upon you in their fullness because of the multitude of your sorceries for the great abundance of your enchantments. And we look up this word sorceries in Strong's. It's Strong's Old Testament 3784. And it's kasha, well, it comes back to the root kashaf, which is a primitive root, which is properly to whisper a spell, or in other words, to practice incantation or magic. And it's translated as sorcerer or sorcery or witchcraft. And I remember uh, I was in Jerusalem uh, and I had to go to a hardware store. It was uh, electronics hardware. I was looking for a particular video patch cable. And I remember going into this uh, store and the st- it was a father and son operation. And I, so I asked, uh, I got their card and it said Kashayuf was the name of the store. And I said, what does the, you know, what does the name mean? And the father says, it means witchcraft. And the son says, I thought it meant technology. And the father says, it's the same thing. So at least in the Hebrew concept, the technology, which, uh, and again, this is, uh, I believe it was Arthur C. Clarke that made the comment that any sufficiently advanced technology is like unto witchcraft. Because effectively, we're able to make things happen in our own power and strength that Yahweh doesn't necessarily make happen. So uh, that's the relationship between technology and kashaf or kashayuf, is that it's, again, men making things happen in their own power and strength instead of praying and following the Spirit and waiting for Yahweh to bring things about. But we come to Revelation 18 and verse 2, and it says, speaking about an angel or a messenger, it says, And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. And we come here again to the simplified version of the timeline. So again, we know Babylon is fallen. That's uh, uh, the spiritually Babylon is judged at trumpet seven, and then in the physical Babylon falls when the cup, uh, the cup judgments or the bowls of wrath are then poured out. It says, and I heard a voice, uh, Revelation 18 and verse four. So we know we're around the time frame of trumpet seven. That's what the point we're trying to make here. So at trumpet seven, it says, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. Why? Is because the plagues are going to be poured out during the cup judgments or during the bowls of wrath. So that especially is a time uh, not to be in the United States of America is around the time frame of Trumpet 7. It says in Revelation 18, continuing in verse 7, it says, in the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously. Two things we should never do. We should decrease so that he can increase. And if we're living luxuriously, why are we not using that money to further the Great Commission? It says, in the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as queen and am no widow and will see no sorrow. Therefore her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is Yahweh Elohim who judges her. So notice how the tie-in, and then we come back to Jeremiah 51, starting in verse 5. And he, he does tell us, he says, For Israel is not forsaken, nor Judah, by his Elohim, Yahweh of hosts, though their land was filled with sin against the set-apart one of Israel. So even though the land is filled with sin, Yahweh knows who is truly serving him and who is simply looking out for their own glorification, their own luxury, and their own pleasure. That's what it comes down to. Continuing in verse 6, but to those of of us who have ears to hear, he says, Flee from the midst of Babylon, and everyone save his life, 
do not be cut off in her iniquity. For this is the time of Yahweh's vengeance. He shall recompense her. Again, trumpet seven is, is opens the cup judgments. So that is not the time to be in the United States. In fact, if we can leave earlier, then we do not partake of her iniquity. So verse 7, Yahweh says, Babylon was a golden cup in Yahweh's hand that made all the earth drunk. The nations drank her wine. Therefore the nations are deranged. And we take a look at the nations. People do things other than look out for the message of Yahweh and look out for the benefit of their fellow man. That's deranged behavior because Yahweh punishes such things. Continuing in verse 8. It says, Babylon has suddenly fallen and been destroyed. Wail for her. Take balm for her pain. Perhaps she may be healed. He says, we would have healed Babylon, but she is not healed. Forsake her and let us go everyone to his own country. Now this is speaking after the cups. He says, for her judgment reaches to heaven and is lifted up to the skies. And there it says, again, we know we're after the cups, and it says, Yahweh has revealed our righteousness. Come and let us declare in Sion the work of Yahweh our Elohim. So this is the people, they've lived through the destruction upon the land of Babylon. Yahweh has thoroughly pleaded their cause. Babylon has fallen and been destroyed, and now Yahweh reveals their righteousness. And it's, well, we're not staying here in Babylon now let's go back to the land of Israel. And this will contain both Ephraim and Judah. And we'll talk about that in other places. Continuing to verse 11, uh, now Yahweh goes into more detail about the destruction on the land. He says, Make the arrows bright. Gather the shields. Yahweh has raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes. And the Medo-Persian Empire was Iran. So the Medes, when you see Medes, think Iran. For his plan, and this is very realistic because we know that the Iranians have a missile program and they also have, uh, or at least they had, a nuclear weapons uh, program. So we put two and two together. He says, for his plan is that even if they stick with the 15-year uh, moratorium or whatever it is, this brings us still, we're looking at the cup judgments at, at least 27 years and 10 months away from now. So this is uh, a very realistic possibility just looking at the headlines today. It says, For his plan is against Babylon to destroy it. And what do we hear coming out of Iran? Death to the USA. Death to Israel. He says, For, he, for his plan is against Babylon to destroy it because it is the vengeance of Yahweh, the vengeance for his temple. Drop down to verse 13. We talk about the characteristics of the land of Babylon. Why do we think it's the United States and not Iraq? It says, O you who dwell by many waters. Well, that's clearly not Iraq. Uh, abundant in treasures, that's also not Iraq. So the United States has the eastern seaboard, the east coast on the Atlantic Ocean, also has the Gulf of Mexico, and there's another, and then the west coast has the Pacific Ocean, uh, also Alaska has the Pacific Ocean uh, contact, uh, Arctic. Uh, so there's a lot of water in America. The land is also, Chris, uh, it's got numerous rivers. It's got the Mississippi River, the Columbia River, the Colorado River, a lot of very large, very great rivers. So it says, you who dwell by many waters, abundant in treasures. This fits America, the United States. Your end has come, the measure of your covetousness. Well, why is America being destroyed? It's a measure of America's covetousness. Now, as we sail, we're speaking about many waters, as we sail into New York Harbor, we're greeted with the Statue of Liberty. This is a Masonic Lodge statue. Uh, it's actually, a, a I believe it's of Ashtoreth or Astarte, also known as Ishtar. In other words, it's the Statue of Easter. Once again, a, it's a Babylonian fertility goddess. Also, as you sail into New York Harbor, you're greeted with a big sign that says, Welcome to Babylon. So the town of Babylon is there in Suffolk County. It's on Long Island in New York, in the United States. Now also, for more identifying characteristics, we, have, we saw before three temples to Jupiter, or Zeus, or Satan, or Lucifer, the light bringer. So we have St. Peter's Basilica on the left. I'm going to have to 
uh, drop down in size here. We have St. Peter's Basilica on the left. And then we have the Temple of Jupiter Stator, which is uh, an ancient temple. And then we have the Dome of the Rock on the right. Now these are all three uh, temples to Jupiter. Now notice they have the cupola, which is basically a mammary gland. And they have the nipple on the top. Now we also saw what we called Zeus's throne. It's also called Satan's seat in the book of Revelation. It was originally in Pergamos in western Turkey. Now it has three main characteristics on it. It's got the stairs up the front, and it's got what might be called bookends on either side, and then it's got sort of to forms uh, more or less of a horseshoe shape. Now notice, take a look at the U.S., the House, but also the Senate. Uh, the Senate is based on the Babylonian or the Roman senatorial system. Notice the building itself has the cupola, um, the horseshoe, uh, and also the bookends and the front staircase. And what is practiced there is Greco-Roman democracy, so a Babylonian style, a Greco-Roman Babylonian democracy. And one of the things about democracy is there's a division of the authority. It's not power is vested in one man in the kingship, as it is in Scripture. Instead, there's a division of authority, and this division leads to infighting and also confusion. So if we actually, if we come to, we take a look at the word for Babylon. It's the Hebrew word Bavel. And Hebrew is an interesting language. It's uh, one of the only languages that it's, it's both alphabetic and it's pictographic. So you can get the meaning of the word both from the alphabet or you can look at what's called the Hebrew word pictures. So in Hebrew, each letter is a word picture in and of itself. So we take the word picture for a house, and then we have another word picture for a house. And then we have the word picture for authority, which is a goad, or a, what's called a lamed in Hebrew. So what we have is the meaning here is house, house, authority. Meaning we have two houses between which the authority is divided. Well, what does Yeshua say about when we have division of power? In Mark chapter 3, in verse 24, Yeshua says, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand, verse 25. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. That's a perfect picture of what happens inside of democracy. And that's why democracies can be overtaken, they can be infiltrated and overtaken by the green horse, by cousin Ishmael. Uh, they've taken that to an art form. And the reason why is because there's a division in the power in the house. So let's take this to Jeremiah chapter 51, starting in verse 45, where Yahweh says, My people, go out of the midst of her, and let everyone deliver himself from the fierce anger of Yahweh. He says, And lest your heart faint, and you fear for the rumor that will be heard in the land. He says, A rumor will come in one year, and after that, in another year a rumor will come, and violence in the land, ruler against ruler. So again, we have more than one seat of authority, more than one house trying to take hold of the Laman. And what we see in these end times is the four horses fighting. So we have Team Black-White, uh, you might call the Genesis uh, 35 alliance, the, the Judah-Joseph, the military-industrial complex. And then you also have Team Red Green, which is uh, Esau and Ishmael. So uh, Ish Ishmael doesn't really care for Esau, but he's using him, and everyone effectively in the end is against the white horse. But notice there's going to be civil war in the land, and Yahweh is warning us to leave the United States before the civil war, if we can. And a lot of people will say, well, I would leave the United States, but the economy is so much better here. The economy is so much more difficult in these other nations. And th one of the reasons that the economy is so much better in the United States is because, uh, on the one hand, it's the homeland of Joseph. On the other hand, it's the land of Babylon. It's a military economic empire, and it maintains a certain uh, flow of goods and luxuries to itself through the subjugation of other nations worldwide through the spoils, so to speak. 
and we uh, read about this in Mishlei or Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 19, King Solomon says, It's better to be of a humble spirit among the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. So what we should be doing, I believe, and this is a big test for many, uh, many people, but I believe what we should be doing in these end times is Yeshua gives us the Great Commission. And what he's saying is, uh, if you won't go on the Great Commission one way, uh, we're going dist- to turn up the heat effectively in your homeland to get you to go on the Great Commission field another way. So he says in Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 19, he says, Go therefore and make disciples in all the nations, immersing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the set-apart Spirit, teaching them to observe or to guard all things that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So if you would like to help Nazarene Israel, Nazarene Israel is seeking to relocate to South America. If you'd like to help us in this, or if you'd like to read more about the effort, please go to www.nazareneisrael.org. Hope to see you again in part 21. Shalom.